It is a pleasure to introduce Michal kotler Wunsch. She was a member of Knesset between 2020 and 2021. In September of last year, she was named Israel's special envoy to combat anti-Semitism. The title of her talk is Rising Anti-Semitism on Campus, Online, and on the Streets, What You Can Do About It. We are deeply grateful that she has taken time out of her busy schedule to share her insights with us. Please welcome Michelle kotler Wunsch. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, and, and I hope that um, I'll speak as briefly as I can just to maybe frame the conversation, but I very much hope to hear from you and address questions that I'm sure you have. Um, uh, I'll share maybe a little bit um, a little bit of context. I'm coming here actually from spending uh, the majority of the day in Mount Herzl in the Hall of Names. Uh, and basically, uh, actually one of my closest friends whose son, a uh, close friend of the family, was killed on 10-7. Um, who was there and we went to see his name in a uh, in, in, in Mount Herzl. And what occurred to me as I was walking with her through Mount Herzl, and if you haven't been and you have time, I would recommend to go. Because what occurred to me as I was walking through Mount Herzl with Debbie um, was essentially all of the soldiers uh, that were killed on 10-7 and have been buried there are buried very close to Tashach, to the 1948 um, soldiers, really, really close. The Chilka is very close, which doesn't necessarily make sense, and then it really does. And the reason that really does and really resonated was in many ways you're here at what I think is a historic moment for Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people to which Jews, a prototypical indigenous people, returned 75 years ago. Um, you're here at what I think is a historic moment for the Jewish people, and I actually think you're here at what I think is a historic moment for democracies. Um, and all of those intersected in many ways in 10-7. Um, so when I thought of the War of Independence, and as we speak and war continues actually to rage, as you know, when we continue to bury our friends' children and our children's friends, um, which is very hard to feel when you're not in Israel. And even when you're in Israel, it sort of seems like things are normal in whatever capacity. What occurred to me um, that is very important, and I think that it's incredible that you're here for this time, is that at this existential moment in which Israel is actually in many ways fighting its second Independence Day war, um, uh, the conversation that I wanted to frame for us is not just about anti-Semitism, although I am Israel's special envoy for combating anti-Semitism. It's actually about the implications of what we see in the rising anti-Semitism, as I, the title talks to on campuses, online, and in the streets, but what that means at this moment of intersection in terms of how we identify and combat that anti-Semitism from a very different perspective, and that is actually from a positive perspective. What does it mean for the Jewish people, a prototypical indigenous people, and I'll say what I mean by that, prototypical indigenous because we speak the same language, Hebrew, we read the same book, the Bible, we traverse the same land, Israel, we practice the same customs and rituals for thousands of years. And that moment of intersection with what we see on campus, with what we see online, with what we see in our uh, social spaces, real world social spaces, not just online social spaces, is that moment of opportunity that I thought we would talk about a little bit um, uh, in, in, in our time together. Most importantly, what I want to say to you is that having you here for me is an extremely um, uh, hope invoking and hope filling opportunity. So when I look at you, and you're a little bit younger than me, and I think that you have chosen to take the time to come here now on your break, what that does for me um, in this role and in general is actually give me a great deal of hope. And here I like to quote the late Rabbi Sachs I was just mentioning because he differentiated between optimism and hope, saying that optimism is the belief that everything will be okay. So in Israel, we say a lot of yebiseder, everything's going to be okay, except hope is the belief that together we can make it okay. And in that sense, optimism is a very passive virtue, whereas hope is a very active one. 
And it takes not very much courage to be an optimist, but a great deal of courage to have hope. And Israel's national anthem, as you know, is Hatikva. So looking at you and knowing that you have chosen to be here at this time, it gives me a great deal of hope, knowing that that requires action and courage as we delve into this topic. I'll share with you maybe my own story of that Shabbat morning, um, October 7th. It was also Simchat Torah. And I mentioned um, Jews as an indigenous people reading the same book. Well, Simchat Torah is the pinnacle of recognition that we renew a cycle of reading, which we're um, now actually this Shabbat going to be reading Shmot when the Jews become a people, actually, from a set of families. Um, that Shabbat morning, um, uh, in many ways, we were awakened at a 6.30 a.m., most of us in the country, us and Ranana at 6.30 a.m., siren, warning of incoming rockets. Now, from an international law perspective, that's what I do. Every one of those rockets that have been targeting Israel for years, actually, is a double war crime. Why a double war crime? Because those rockets shot at Israelis not only target Israeli civilians, but they are launched from densely populated civilian areas in Gaza. That's a double war crime. Now that morning, there was this feeling in the air of something different, because as ridiculous as what I just said sounds, double war crime each one, thousands of rockets on 10-7 and since 10-7, thousands. Um, despite the fact that it's a double war crime, Israelis go on as if everything is normal. And that's what we did. We actually left our safe room as everybody else in the country, and went to synagogue that morning because it was Shabbat and Simchat Torah. And it took hours on that day, and I don't know if people have shared their experience of that day, but everybody has a story, and I encourage you, I don't know if you've yet engaged Israelis and how much time you have left. Everybody has a story of how they experienced that day, and I think it's important to understand that there was not one person in this country not implicated in one way or another with what happened on 10-7. I say 10-7 because like 9-11, it changed not just our world, it changed the world. For us, we went to synagogue, and in many ways, there was 50 years after the Yom Kippur War, something that was identifiable even before we knew what it was. Many of us understood that this was not just a double war crime shot at us and waking us up in the morning at 6.30 a.m. It was something else, but we didn't know yet what. And more shocking than what the um, uh, developments of the day exposed in terms of the atrocities, the war crimes, if I use the language of international law, the war crimes and the crimes against humanity perpetrated on that day of burning and rape and mutilation and murder and abduction of thousands of Israelis on that day. In many ways more shocking for many people around the world were the responses to the atrocities of that day. The responses that not decades later, like in the case of the Holocaust, not months later, not days later, hours after the fact, after over 3,000 genocidal terrorists live streamed the atrocities that they per perpetrated, began the denial of what happened on that day, or even as people were just beginning to understand, there was an immediate denial. Denial that was followed by justification, that would fo was followed by support, that was followed by attack of Jews on campuses, on streets, and online in response to atrocities that the Jewish people had not experienced since the Holocaust. So in many ways, I think for most people, that was surprising, unfathomable, unexpected. Uh, I'll share that in my role as special envoy, although I was appointed just literally weeks before the war broke out, I've actually been engaged on the front lines of tracking what we will maybe talk about, the mutation of anti-Semitism, the mutation of anti-Semitism that has taken on this form of uh, the mainstream modern strain and anti-Semitism being the oldest hatred in the world, the way that it survived over thousands of years is actually by latching onto the guiding social construct of the time, religion, science, and I'll say from my own devastating understanding, the secular religion, if you will, of our times, human rights or social justice. 
It's important because that has implications. At each and every time that anti-Semitism latched onto and mutated according to the guiding social construct of the time, that didn't just adversely affect Jews that were then targeted by the new strain of anti-Semitism. That adversely affected the social construct, be it science, be it religion, be it the secular religion of our times, human rights, infrastructures, principles, social justice. And so from my perspective on the front lines of tracking this mutation of an ever mutating hatred to the mutated modern mainstream strain that I refer to as anti-Zionism or the denial of Israel's right to exist in any borders. And it should be very clear for whoever, whoever it wasn't clear to post 10-7 the 10 7 was not about 1967, yesterday in Samaria, yes, Gaza, what are the borders? It was about 1948. It was about Israel's very existence. And as if to drive the point a little bit further, and I don't know if you've toured the th south, but those, many of those Yishuvim, Kibbutzim, right on the border, well, 72 year old Vivian Silver, Canadian Israeli, was a peace activist, as peace activist as they come. And she was not only murdered, but it took five weeks to identify her remains. It had nothing to do with politics. It had nothing to do with borders. It had to do with Israel's very existence, where we are, in any borders at all. And so, from my perspective, tracking that mutation of this ever-mutating hate and understanding that anti-Zionism is the modern mainstream strain that enabled this uh, uh, infection of societies or spaces or places to take hold, um, that anti-Zionism was clear uh, to be, um, uh, or, or was clear to me, not to everybody, that it will cause the pendulum to swing and result in anti-Semitism that attacks Jews online, on campuses, and on streets in response to the worst atrocities perpetrated against Jews since the Holocaust. And maybe I'll share a little bit of my analysis um, from the perspective of international law, spaces, institutions, and if this interests you at all, then I actually gave a much fuller talk about this at the UN. But the understanding that the 1975 UN resolution, Zionism is racism, by the way, two days ago projected on Yankee Stadium, I don't know how many of you saw that, Zionism is racism, that's a 1975 UN resolution, Soviet propaganda driven, that the understanding that that is alive and well, not just on Yankee Stadium two days ago, but that that is alive and well on university campuses in 2023 in the name of progress is something that we have to sort of give our attention to. Zionist or Zionism, Zionism, an over 140 year old progressive national liberation movement that enabled the return of that prototypical indigenous people that I, return, that I referred to before to return to an ancestral homeland after thousands of years of exile persecution, Zionism is part and parcel of my identity. It doesn't mean it's part and parcel of the identity of all Jews, and it doesn't mean that there are no non-Jews who self-define as Zionists. What it does mean that taking my identity of Zionist and uh, uh, making it very clearly over decades synonymous with racist so that when I come to campus, true story, in a, a campus speaking tour across North American law schools just last year at NYU, at Columbia, at Rutgers, at Yale, at CUNY, and I come to speak about anti-Semitism, but the response to my speech is big signs that say Zionists not welcome. Anti-Zionism is the new mutated strain of anti-Semitism that we have to be able to identify if we are going to be able to combat this strain of anti-Semitism. Calling me or synonymously assuming that if I am a Zionist, I am a racist means that in DEI infrastructures, diversity, equity, inclusion principles, well, Diversity, equity, and inclusion principles, they don't apply to racists, do they? So if I self-define as a Zionist, I don't deserve the protection, so to speak, of a DEI infrastructure, and then we have a problem. After the Zionism is Racism 1975 UN resolution, and this is important just to understand that this is a process, a process that has enabled the demonization, the delegitimization, and the double standard that used to, in traditional anti-Semitism, perhaps I would say does again, uh, a traditional anti-Semitism target the individual Jew, barring him or her from an equal place in society. Well, the demonization, the delegitimization of the double standard morphing to targeting the proverbial Jew among the nations, that is the state of Israel, 
that would enable this kind of mutation. So Zionism is racism, then followed by, and I'm just giving you little milestone moments, the 2001 Durban Conference Against Racism, Durban, South Africa. The Durban Conference Against Racism turned into an anti-Semitic hate fest. And actually, since 2001, the majority of the campuses that you all study in have held Israel Apartheid Weeks every single year. 23 years now of Israel Apartheid Weeks. No question mark above that. Now, I'm old enough, and some of us in this room, not so many of us, are old enough to remember very well what apartheid was. It happens to be anecdotally that my father represented Nelson Mandela, so I remember a little better what apartheid was. And Israel has its set of issues. But just as Zionism is not racism, so is Israel not an apartheid state except that in an Orwellian inversion, it has become synonymous. So when you say Zionists may not deserve protection if they are racist, well, Israel does not deserve to exist if it is an apartheid state. And I'll share, to me, the most Orwellian inversion of them all, and we are living through it right now, is the appropriation or the co-opting and the weaponization of the Holocaust itself, of genocide, a term coined by Raphael Lemkin in order to be able to describe the atrocities too terrible to imagine, but not too terrible to have happened during the Holocaust. Genocide for which we now mark 75 years to the Convention for the Punishment and the Prevention of Genocide. Genocide itself used or weaponized in order to do two things simultaneously, which is a very, very interesting thing about Jew hatred. On one hand, call for the genocide of Jews on university campuses with some presidents thinking that that needs context, except that what we have to pay attention to in that sense is if it was okay to call for the genocide of every other group on campus, then hey, it's okay. The point being at that hearing that I'm sure some of you saw, that the double standard is what is glaring. If it is not okay for the, to call for the genocide of anyone on campus except Jews, we have a problem, and it is not okay to call for the genocide of anyone on campus, including any other group that you can imagine, but what that three presidents had a hard time to call out and say, no, that is a violation of our code of conduct because calling for the genocide of any group as well as calling for the genocide of Jews is not okay. And in this Orwellian reality, at the very same time as that happens, Israel is accused of perpetrating a genocide. In the aftermath of atrocities that the Jewish people have not experienced the likes of since the Holocaust, the makings of genocide, because if you look at the definition of genocide, targeting a specific group with the intent of wiping them out as Hamas leaders, Hamas being a genocidal terror organization that in its charter, just like Mein Kampf, calls for the murder of Jews and the annihilation of Israel, have committed to not perpetrating one 10 7, but 10 10 sevens, a million 10 sevens. The understanding that then that term is used by none other than South Africa to accuse the state of Israel at The Hague of genocide as we speak. Right now, so ongoing, I'm not sure how, if you're following you know, that part of it, but next week there will be a first uh, sort of hearing held, an emergency hearing at The Hague. What we've just sort of gone through is a very quick um, rendition of what I would call the mutation of anti-Semitism. The mutation of anti-Semitism, an ever-mutating virus. And you know, post-COVID, we've all become experts in viruses. We understand that if you inoculate against the original strain of any virus, but it continues to then mutate and develop new strains, you best find inoculations for the new strain of that virus that you want to inoculate society from. Well, in that sense, this new strain of anti-Semitism was very well defined. And it was very well defined in post, not in, but post the 2001 Durban Conference Against Racism that I mentioned before. When basically the first or the opening shot, if you will, understanding of all of those legal experts that were there at Durban, the understanding that it was very, their very principles, their tools of the trade, if you will, that were co-opted and weaponized at Durban and then thereafter in the 23 years of Israel apartheid weeks resulted in the beginning of the creation of a long democratic process and the creation of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. If you remember nothing else when you walk out or when I'm done talking, 
please, I implore, read the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. It's one page. It's a very important understanding. And there are a lot of conversations about the IRA, the IRA yes or the IRA no, IRA being the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, acronym. The IRA definition, the result of a very long democratic process, is the only and the benchmark definition used, including by the coalition of special envoys from around the world of which I am a member, the only definition that enables to identify and combat this strain of anti-Semitism. And it does so because it includes what I refer to as the three Ds, Anatoly Sharansky's or Natan Sharansky's three Ds, the demonization, the delegitimization, and the double standard. Those are the process or the mechanism, those three Ds, that enable over and over again, and not a very long time ago, I spoke in New York at the German embassy about the Convention for the Punishment and Prevention of Genocide, the understanding that genocide, when it occurs, whether in Rwanda, whether in Bosnia, or whether in the Holocaust, was enabled by those three Ds, the dehumanization, the delegitimization, and the double standard, that actually enables people to walk by a pit poster of a 10-month-old baby who's held hostage and rip it down because that's not a human baby. That's before the denial piece or the justification. But to them, if that's, not a, that's a legitimate target. That's not a baby like my baby. The result of the three Ds are what have enabled throughout history the perpetration of atrocities like the Jewish people experienced in the Holocaust. And when I say the prospective commitment of never again Never again in the future, because we can't prevent the past. We can only prevent the recurrence of atrocities too terrible to imagine, but not too terrible to happen. That's not just never again to us, the Jewish people. It's never again to anyone. And to understand what those mechanisms that enable over time atrocities too terrible to imagine, but not too terrible to happen, we have to understand those mechanisms, those three Ds are critical. So the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism is the beginning of a conversation. As a, and it's called a working definition because it is a resource. It's called a working definition because I mentioned before the mutation of anti-Semitism. We know that there will be another strain of the most ancient hatred in the world because that's what's happened for thousands of years. And we have to be able to identify and combat it beginning with the first step. It's not because I'm a lawyer, but lawyers will tell you that every law begins with definitions. In order to be able to identify and combat anything, you have to first define it. And so maybe before I open it up to questions, I'd like to say on the positive and, um, and where I think what you can do about it, if you want, if you decide to do about it, is an understanding that there is a war. There is a war that is raging. And the war that's raging in Israel is much more tangible. You know, as I was walking through Mount Herzl today, that's what occurred to me, is that I keep flying abroad and I've been on six emergency trips abroad since 10-7. But there is a war raging not just in Israel. Where Israel and the entire Israeli public that is deployed to this war, by the way, transcending real or perceived differences of pro-judicial reform or against judicial reform, but much more than that, of Jew and non-Jew, of religious and secular, transcending all real and perceived differences. It's very important that we recognize that Israel is not an apartheid state because Israel is not an apartheid state. 20% of its minorities are completely included, including in fighting this war, whether on the front lines, literally, or in home front command, which are the front lines in hospitals, in, 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 in civilian spaces, in morgues. The understanding in ambulances in what happened what happened on 107 in its removal of masks showed us that it's not just a war that's raging here in Israel and it's not just a war that has impacted Jews around the world in the same anti-semitism inspired responses to 107 that we spoke about denial justification support for and attack of Jews in various spaces it's actually an attack, an assault on our shared humanity. Because the atrocities of 10-7, and again, I'll refer back to 9-11, the atrocities of 10-7, if you can't unequivocally condemn that, that is an assault on our shared humanity. 
if you can justify or find that exhilarating or find that resistance, or there have been many other words coined since 10-7 to describe the atrocities, that associating them with the word progress should actually, for those of us that deem ourselves progressive, those of us that deem ourselves holding liberal values, we should be at the forefront of saying, that is not progress, that is regress. If you can't unequivocally condemn that or you stand at demonstrations holding up signs that say, we are Hamas, and just the other day, I can't remember the chant, it's always very good chants, but something about Yemen turn another ship around, meaning Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, all of them, among other proxies, the proxies of a murderous regime in an Islamist Iran that does the very same thing to its own people. Murder and rape and abduct, the very same thing as its proxies. If you can't denounce that, then you are actually partaking in the assault on humanity that 10-7 was. And that's where in many ways I think that the opportunity and I would say the responsibility to reach across differences, across differences of politics and religion and geography and every one of those differences that we held maybe as part of our identification or self-identification as something that differentiates us and exposes something on 10-7 that says, wait a minute, the line in the quicksand that was drawn not just in the atrocities of 10-7, but in the responses of 10-7, they show us something that we better pay attention to because it's quicksand and it's disappearing very, very quickly. What they showed us is that on one side of that line in the quicksand that compares between a democratic country and the genocidal civilization that seeks to destroy it is civilization. And the majority of us are on that side. And on the other side of it, are the genocidal terror organizations and their supporting countries. And the funny thing with authoritarian regimes is they actually say what they mean and they mean what they say. You just have to look at Khamenei's twi Twitter because guess what? Twitter hasn't uh, adopted the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism. So he tweeted days before 10-7 and ever since that, the complete commitment not only to annihilate the state of Israel, but to build on the rubble of our shared civilization an alternate reality in which I believe none of us want to live. And so there is this moment of understanding and responsibility to reach or to transcend and reach across differences and understand that the war that is raging is also raging in the country that you come from. And it is much harder to see, and it's a different kind of war. I like to call it the unconventional war for public opinion or the war of ideas. And in that war, there is not one of us none of us that has the ability to opt out of. I mean, we can opt out or put our head down. But the, the, the very understanding that I think 10-7 offered is that this is a call to action. It's a moment in which I truly believe that each one of you has the capacity to make a difference in your circles of influence, on campus, in your future workspaces, in your families, in your communities. And in many ways, I think that in that sense, the call to action is one that says, we're in war, and maybe I'll end where I began. I walked around Mount Herzl today recognizing that there are people your age, 19 and 20 and 21 and 22 and older, that understand that in war we lose friends, but this is an existential moment, and it's not just an existential moment for the State of Israel. It's not just an existential moment for the Jewish people. It is an existential moment for the foundations of our shared humanity, for communities, families, societies that cherish those foundational principles of life and of liberty. And I hope very much that your trip here, I'm sure it has given you a lot to think about. And more than anything, I think that you have the capacity to be those boots on the ground, to take everything that you've learned or to engage with knowledge that you may not have or don't feel like you possess, knowing that what you have is the right to claim identity just like everybody else. If I began somewhere again, it is the reclamation of identity that says Zionism is not racism. And I am a Zionist because I am a member of a prototypical indigenous people that returned to an ancestral homeland after thousands of years of exile and persecution in a country that is committed to equality, imperfect. But what I just said to you is the Declaration of Independence. If you read something else, 
today after this talk, it would be the Declaration of Independence. Basically, I would say the positive element of understanding what it is, why we're sitting here in this country right now and what it is that we aspire to. Again, imperfect as it may be, but the Declaration of Independence of that nation state of the Jewish people that the state of Israel is committed to equality, which the state of Israel is. And in that sense, in many ways, enables your generation, our generation, just to be the support staff your generation to be on the front lines of what I think is really a rendezvous with history, as FDR said, a very important moment in our shared civilization um, and in history. So I'm going to open it up. I'm going to stop talking because I think it'll be more interesting. Thank you.